So I'm going to essentially talk about the fatigue and fracture behavior of uh, 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 you know, pressure vessels and piping, which are pressure boundary materials. Uh, essentially, let's see if I can change the slides. Yeah, so uh, this webinar essentially is represented by this tetrahedra. We are talking about processing, structure, properties, and applications, which is performance. And I think what I'm going to talk about is the connection between properties and structure a bit, and of course, properties and how they affect the performance or how they affect the application. Now, uh, in our lab at CSR NML, we have always been intrigued by the effect a microstructure has when a stress is applied to it. But we know that it's a continuous process of deformation, uh, which results in the accumulation of strain, which further interacts with the microstructure and you ultimately uh, create surfaces to create a fracture. And we get the mechanical properties from the deformation end and the fracture properties from the fracture end. But the very fact that all this is part of the same process means that all of these are correlated, are interrelated. And one of our you know, main business over here at NML is trying to understand this process of damage. And we are also interested in structural integrity assessment. Uh, essentially, whenever you have any critical structural components, uh, you require three types of information for, from it in order to be able to assess the integrity of the structure when it is in service. You would want to know through non-destructive surveillance the type of defects that have been generated in it during service. You would be uh, you would like to simulate and model that structure or component in order to be able to comment on the stress situation that that uh, uh, component is uh, seeing, and you would want to characterize the material to understand what is the state of the material, uh, you know, of which that uh, component or structure is made including the degradation that has happened during service. Once you know the material, you have to obtain the damage resistance data. You have to understand how damage is incorporated into the material or how the material resists the incorporation of damage into the material. That can be done through uh, you know, uh, testing in a lab, experimental evaluation, or from documented information. And what we do primarily in our group is develop or generate that damage resistance data so that that combined with the stress analysis and the non-destructive surveillance data by using codes, softwares, and protocols, you can do a structural integrity assessment. Of course, from time to time, you would have to validate what you are doing or saying through a full-scale testing. And that is the type of activities also in, the, in which we sometimes uh, involve ourselves with. So having said that and said the background, what I want to specifically talk about is on pressure vessel and piping material, which we have been looking at for quite some time now in our group. In fact, uh, we have been looking at three uh, uh, of the materials, a carbon manganese steel, a stainless steel, and a low alloy steel, all of which pertain to the nuclear power industry. And we have been looking at various aspects and dimensions of it, right from the deformation behavior to the fatigue behavior, to the fatigue crack growth rate behavior, to ductile fracture, and of course, microstructural characterization. But what I will restrict myself to is the things, you know, the letters which are highlighted in yellow. So I'll be talking about a stainless steel and a low alloy steel, and I'll be looking at uh, fatigue and fracture behavior I'm trying to understand how these relate to in terms of uh, the, the, the damage mechanics aspects and also in uh, respect of generation of data for structural integrity. So let me start by looking at the low alloy steel, the fracture behavior of a 20 mn MO Ni55 steel, as it is called. You know, these steels, I don't know if you can see my cursor, and if you can see that red arrow over there on the left. These steels are used in a nuclear power plant for making the pressure vessel, uh, the vessel that, that in, encloses uh, the actual the heart of the nuclear power plant. And uh, uh, these, therefore, have to be very tough. They uh, should not fail at any point of time. 
and their fatigue and fracture behavior therefore is extremely important. So we are talking about this team, which essentially has a Benetic structure. The input material, which we were looking at is an 85 mm thick forge plate. So it's a pretty thick forge plate with the chemistry as is given over here and with the room temperature properties given over here, typically a strength of about uh, 600 plus MPA and a elongation of about 40%. So high strength and high toughness material for this class of application. Uh, however, there's a lot of problems with this chemistry and therefore the fatigue and fracture behavior has to be looked at really carefully. So uh, one of the aspects that we were looking at is, uh, you know, how do you transfer the data that you generate in the lab to a component? You have obtained the fracture toughness data for the material using standard specimens in the lab, but can you directly use that in a component? How do you use it? So one very easy way of looking at it is by you know, doing tests with uh, specimens of various sizes. So we have a one CT and a half CT and a quarter CT specimen, which we have used to do this test, this fracture of this test. And you can also vary the crack depth in each of the specimens, in, in the specimens. And as you vary the crack depth, you change the constraint condition at the crack tip or the triaxiality that is attending the crack tip. And essentially that is what is difference between your specimen and the component or structure which has a crack. So that will help us to understand if there is a parameter which can be used to transfer the data from the specimen to the component. So that, that was the motivation for doing this work. This work I must say at this moment is actually the PhD work of Dr. Tamshuk Choudhury who was uh, registered for his PhD at IIEST Shippur and uh, who worked with us throughout uh, in doing this work. So uh, whenever you're doing a fracture toughness test, essentially what you do, and this is just another uh, type of specimen, a three point bend specimen, you load this specimen to take it through loading, unloading, reloading type of sequences as is shown in the uh, you know, schematic graph in the bottom. And through this loading, you can get a load and load line displacement plot, which is shown over here. So you have a, a, a loading envelope curve and the periodic down uh, lines that you have are the periodic unloadings that you are doing. And what you do is from that data, from the that experimental data, from these periodic unloading lines, from the slope of the periodic unloading line, you get the compliance and calculate the crack length. So as the ductile fracture is taking place, as the crack is growing, what is the crack length at any instant? That is what you get from there. And from essentially the area under the curve through these equations, which are pretty standard, you can get the J integral, which is a, a crack driving force for the material and get a J versus A, a tearing curve like that. Of course, that's not the end of the story. Once you have the tearing curve, we have to do a number of operations as per standard. You have to obtain the blunting line. You have to obtain a power law fit. You have to offset the blunting line to get a provisional uh, fracture toughness, the JQ that you see. You can also determine the initiation toughness, the JI. And uh, of course, you can reiterate this by uh, you know, redefining the blunting line and seeing that you get uh, standard values and, and, and make sure that they uh, conform to J1C if your conditions are right. So, so we did that with the various specimen sizes that you see over there. And these are the load displacement plots for the various crack lengths, A by W. If you look at the key in each plot, you will find that there is a range of A by W and we are typically varying it from 0.35 to 0.7 and by making the crack deeper, we are changing the constraint conditions and therefore changing the, uh, the, the triaxiality at the crack tip and seeing how that affects the fracture toughness. So from all these data, we calculated the JR curves and here are the JR curves for the three specimen size, the full CT, the half CT and the quarter CT. And you see that uh, they differ. They differ because the constraint conditions are different. There is a specimen size effect because you're going from a full CT to a half CT to a quarter CT. And there is also a constraint effect because you're changing the crack length. 
and we wanted to see what type of difference does it make. So from these JR curves, if you work out the JQ, because for the smallest uh, specimen size for the quarter CT, you may not be able to get a valid J1C. However, uh, you won't be able to get a valid J1C. However, you will be able to get a JQ. So we did that. And this is how the JQ and the JI, the initiation toughness varied for the three different sizes of specimens as a function of track length. And of course, in the graph at the bottom, the tearing modulus is also shown. So what you see is the toughness defined by JI or JQ is different for different specimen sizes and it also changes with the track length. So how do you, uh, how do you live with this? How do you uh, uh, merge them together or how do you get a parameter through which you can interpolate? So the way that is done is by looking at a, a, a standard uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, JR, HRR field obtained by doing a finite element uh, analysis of a small scale yielding solution of a crack tip like that. And then you get the plastic strain distribution of the crack tip from which you can work out the J field. This is called the SSY solution. And when you compare the SSY solution from the actual specimen solution that, that you get for the various types of specimens that you tested with different uh, sizes and different uh, A by W, you get plots like that. So uh, you have the stress fields for the various A by W in any of these plots. You find that as your crack length is much smaller, let's say 0.3, your stress field is much depressed to what you would get when your crack length uh, to width ratio is 0 0.5, which is the standard that the, uh, which is the standard uh, crack depth that the uh, testing standard specifies. So 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, the stress field is up there. And if you compare that with the small scale yielding solution, which is given by the red line at the top of each of the plots, you find that there is a difference between the SSY solution and the actual solution that you get in your specimens. And this difference can be quantified by a parameter which is known as Q, which is nothing but the difference between the SSY field and the actual field that you're getting normalized by the flow stress at a distance from the crack tip given by R, which is equal to 2J by sigma naught. So these are all normalizing protocols that we use in order to get uh, self-similar values. And from that, you can find out what is the value of key Q for each of these specimen with each of the different crack lengths that you have tested. So when you plot the Q as a function of A by W for the various specimen sizes, the full CT, the half CT, and the quarter CT, that is what you get. And when you plot the, uh, the, the JI, for example, as a function of Q for the various uh, specimen sizes, this is what you get. So essentially what this means is that, that there is a constraint effect, which if you can obtain a Q for each of the fracture toughnesses that you determine using your specimen, then when you want to transfer the data to a component or structure, all you have to do is do a finite element of the component or structure containing the defect, find out the type of Q that is there, and use plots like this to interpolate or extrapolate and find out the fracture toughness that should be ascribed. And of course, this also shows that there is a thickness effect. So depending upon what type of thickness of the component you're using, you might land up totally in a different uh, playing field and you have to be careful. So this was uh, some amount of generation of data that was used for structural integrity assessment of this thick pressure vessel components. Right, I'll go on to another facet of fracture toughness for the same material that we were looking at. You know, uh, what happens if there is a crack in a pressure vessel made of, let's say, 20 mm NMONI 55, a low alloy steel, and you have a earthquake, you have a seismic event. So you suddenly have the load going up and coming down, and that crack might tear. So there would be a fracture toughness which is resisting that tearance, the tearing. So therefore, you require the fracture toughness. 
but are you using the correct fracture toughness for a situation when the load is going up and down like what you would have in a seismic event and that is what we try to uh, address by doing the cyclic GR testing you know 100 years from the Griffith uh, when Griffith propounded his uh, fracture mechanics theories we have come a long way and if you look at the validity of doing such tests from the Griffith point of view, you might say that we are totally violating the type of principles that he had uh, propounded or whatever. However, you know, you don't have any other uh, way to go. You must define a fracture toughness when there is a severe seismic type event, when on a monotonic loading curve, you are superimposing periodic unloadings as you would get during an earthquake as you would get during a seismic event. So that's what we have tried to do. And here is the type of displacement as a function of time that we have tried to you know, uh, uh, put on a CT specimen. And what we have, you know, in order to make it easier and in order to go from one specimen to the other, in order to develop a standard method, what we have done is we have uh, uh, you know, gone to a negative load or we have reduced the load from at any point in the uh, uh, loading envelope equivalent to the R ratio multiplied by the load at that instant. So if I have a R ratio of let's say minus one or minus 0.8, then if my load at any point of time is uh, let's say 20 uh, uh, kilonewton, then I have to go 20 into minus 0.8 kilonewton in the negative direction to give you the unloading and then again go to the next higher unloading and the tearing between each of these peaks is defined by the delta v so how often we are unloading is given in a way by the delta v. so this is how we did the test again a far cry from uh, what uh, a j integral test should actually be done but that is the best you can do in order to obtain a, a fracture toughness uh, which can be applied when a seismic event is taking place. And this is the type of load and load line displacement plot that you obtain from a CT specimen. This is for a R value or an unloading value, which is equivalent to minus 1.2. So one of the most severe kind of seismic event that you can see, or you can uh, think of. And you have periodic unloading after every tearing through uh, a displacement of 0.3 millimeters. So delta V is equal to 0.3 millimeters. So that's the type of uh, the, the, the load and load line displacement plot that you have. And this is another one, I think for R of 0.8, minus 0.8. And the way we go about getting the J integral for in this case to get the JR curve is as follows. You first of all, identify the peaks of load in the, in the, in the uh, data and then obtain the envelope curve, which will define the, you know, the J integral calculation of the J integral or the envelope curve for the J integral calculation. And then at each peak, if you look at the load traverse data as is given in this pink hysteretic type of curve, this is the unload reload cyclic data that is happening at each unloading. You can from the unloading part, the initial a linear portion of the unloading part, you can calculate the crack length and you can calculate the J from the area under the curve. Of course, there are there can be various other protocols of how to calculate the J. Maybe you can take the full area under the hysteretic loop, but this is just one example I'm showing. We, we have found that taking the area up to zero load, so only the positive area under the envelope curve is actually the best way. And that is what Tamshuk had shown. And using the, this uh, principle, we obtain the J and the delta A data, and we construct the JR test. So the procedure is very similar to how we would do a JR test analysis for a, a, a normal J test. However, don't forget that we are violating many of its principles like unloading to a great extent in the process. And these are the JR curves we obtain. It's a bit busy, these plots, but if you look at them carefully, the topmost plot is the monotonic JR curve, which means when you don't have a seismic type loading, when your R is zero. And 
as you impose go to more and more negative r ratios so from 0 you go to minus 0 0.8 minus 1 and minus 1.2 the jr curve gets depressed more and more and uh, this is for delta v of 0 0.5 and 0 0.1 and uh, you know the, the 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 graphs on the left side is for room temperature test and the graph on the right side are for tests that were done at 300 degrees centigrade because essentially this pressure vessel would operate at about 280 or 290 degrees centigrade so you must understand what happens at that temperature now one thing that you realize is that the curves the jr curves are depressed by a very large amount when you try to impose the seismic type events on the loading they are you know the, the minimum decreases to about one sixth at room temperature and one tenth at elevated elevated temperature and also another thing that you may realize at this stage is that at 300 degrees centigrade it appears that the resistance or the tearing resistance of the material is lower and that was very significant because normally you would expect that the material to have more ductility at 300 degrees centigrade and when you obtain the ji and the jq both at the room temperature and 300 this is what you get you find that at r equal to zero which is the rightmost points you find that whatever your fracture toughness was in terms of ji or in terms of jq it reduces drastically when you go to negative R ratios. When you go to minus one or minus 1.2, it becomes one third or one sixth of it, which is a great amount. So essentially your toughness of the material is getting decreased if you have a seismic type event. And your design or your integrity assessment has to factor this in if you are to play safe. So that's the type of information that we obtain. One thing to realize is that at 300 degrees centigrade, the toughness of the material was much lower, even for the monotonic JR curve, that is R equal to uh, uh, R equal to zero, is over here, than at a higher temperature. You know, the black uh, points as opposed to the red points. And why is that? That is because this material has, you know, suffers a dynamic uh, embrittlement, dynamic strain aging uh, at temperatures like 300. I'll come to that later on. But first of all, let me talk a bit about the stretch zone in this material. You know, when you have a sharp crack generated, let us say, through fatigue, and when you load it up, when you're doing a ductile fracture test, the crack tip blunts and blunts a lot. And because of this blunting, you get a stretching at the crack tip, which is what is shown at the top. You know, this is a composite image obtained by taking a lot of fractographs and putting them together. And it's only after the crack tip has blunted by a quite a large amount in a tough material that a ductile fracture would be initiated from that blunted tip. So it's only maybe after this that a ductile fracture would be initiated. And if you carry on loading, that fracture would propagate and you would get a dimpled fracture as you see on the right of the fractograph. So in between the fatigue pre-crack on the left and the ductile fracture on the right, you have a zone in between, which is the stretch zone, which has a different contrast when you're doing scanning electron fractography. And that is the stretch zone. And that has a very close connection with the fracture toughness of the material. The stretch zone, it has been shown earlier and we have also worked on it, can be correlated very well with the fracture toughness. So what has been happening when you carry on, uh, carry out cyclic GR test, when you try to replicate a seismic event during a test or through a test, and what happens to the stretch zone during that time? So uh, we have tried to stop a test during various points, you know, by unloading it from the peak point or by reloading it from the most negative point and sectioning through it and finding out the nature of the crack tip. Something that will uh, strike you very strange, and actually it's not very strange at all, is that there is a plastic wedging at the tip. And although you're trying to take the tip onto minus 1.2 R ratio or minus 1 R ratio, so you're trying to quash the uh, fracture surfaces of the crack together. You're trying to get into a compression mode and you're actually getting into a compression load 
the crack tip perhaps never closes. It's propped open by a plastic hinge that forms at the, uh, at the, at the tip. And not only that, ahead of the tip, you find, and you know, this is normal uh, fracture uh, theory, that you would have microvoids which form at the uh, peak of the stress uh, triaxiality ahead of a tip, and they would grow. And ultimately, when they mature, they would join with the crack tip, or the crack tip would join with them to give you a crack extension. So these microvoids are getting again compressed when you're getting into a compressive load. And in that process, they are getting sharpened. And that perhaps is helping the crack to grow in some way or the other. So these were some observations. But coming back to the stretch zone, see, this is the stretch zone that you would find, you know, the one on the left hand side is for a monotonic JR curve, where you are having, let's say, not a C speak event. And you have a very clean stretch zone, which we have delineated with this yellow line. For a cyclic, test, the stretch zone is given again by this yellow line bordered area. There is a difference in contrast, but it looks slightly different. Of course, one reason is, you know, it has been quashed together. The surfaces has been squashed together when you are getting into compressive load, and that may have obliterated some of the features or maybe sharpened the crack and made some features appear. In fact, when you go to a delta V case where it is 0.1, I think, uh, you find that the stretch zone has striation-like features. If you look at the stretch zone on the uh, fractograph on the right-hand side, if you look carefully, there are parallel lines like striations. So it appears that every time that you, you know, even during the blunting period, every time that you are going into a negative load and reloading it, the sharpening, or the, you know, there are, there are uh, some welding that is taking place, which is leaving behind this, striation like feature on the surface of this stretch zone. But how does that stretch zone compare when you are doing a non seismic type, non cyclic GR test and a cyclic GR test? Well, this is the size of the stretch zone uh, for both room temperature test and test done at 300 degrees centigrade. When you go to lower and lower R ratio, the uh, graph on the right, and you find that the stretch zone decreases slightly, but not that much. So there is a decrease in the stretch zone, which means there is a decrease in the fracture toughness as we have already seen. But does it correspond one to one? Actually, it's easier said than done in the sense it's easier uh, said that it, it is like that, but very difficult to show. And the reason for, uh, you know, a lower, yeah, I was talking about the lower uh, toughness of the material. The reason for that is the occurrence of dynamic strain aging in this 20 MO Ni55 steel. So what you have in this steel is that, uh, 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 you know, even in tensile test, you can see that the strength increases and the elongation decreases as you go test at higher and higher temperatures from up to 300 degrees centigrade. And you can see serrations in your tensile curve, which are redolent of dynamic strain aging being operative. If you do low cycle fatigue, you again see serrations in the hysteresis loops, which indicate that there are DSA. And what is this effect of DSA on the fracture toughness? You know, we, were, we, we saw earlier that the fracture toughness at 300 appears to be lower than at room temperature, whereas I would expect at a higher temperature the material to be more ductile. It's not so because of the DSA. And what we try to do is do temp, you know test at various temperatures at various displacement rates, in order to you know the various displacement rate of tests would essentially give you different strain rates. Difficult to actually calculate the strain rate at the crack tip, although there are some. Uh, 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 empirical relations that are available. You can make some approximations, but we didn't attempt that. We simply looked at different displacement rate and different temperature and to see what happens to the GR curve. No doubt, as we expected, the GR curves got depressed with respect to the room temperature. When you go to high temperature, the graph on the left-hand side, and it becomes particularly low at 235 and recovers again at 285. And that is true even for a different rate, 10 to the power of minus 2 millimeter per second on the right-hand side. 
if you calculate the ji and the jq values at room temperature and at the higher temperatures and see how they vary you find it goes through a trough with the minimum around uh, 240 degree centigrade but then improves again at 285 so if the operation is around 280 to 90 perhaps it's not too bad dsa perhaps will not be that much prevalent but depending again on the strain rate things might not be uh, so nice so you have to be careful so looking at the stretch zone for this material in this dsa range we find that there are some strange things that are happening you find that the stretch zone is not a continuous stretch you have if you look carefully in this fractograph there is a double arrow uh, numbered one on the uh, left hand side which is the first expanse of stretch zone but after that you have some amount of ductile fracture taking place it appears then again you have another expanse of stretch zone number two then again some ductile fracture and then again some expanse of stretch zone so on and so forth before a ductile fracture ensues so therefore what this means is when you are having a fracture event in the dsa regime of this material the 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 stretch zone itself you know the, the the fracture itself will not be a continuous one the stretch will not be a continuous one you'll have a bit of stretching then suddenly a burst of fracture then again a bit of stretching again a burst of fracture so on and so forth and how does that you know this is again at another temperature at another rate and here also in the dsa giant at 235 degree centigrade here also you see this different uh, regimes of stretch zone in the material but at 285, when you have crossed the DSA regime, you find that you have one single expanse of stretch. So that uh, corroborates our, our finding that you have a DSA at around 240 and at 285 or thereabouts, you go out of the region. Now, uh, from the stretch zone, you know, the stretch zone uh, corroborates very well with the uh, initiation of this GI. Which means that if I have a JR curve like that, and this is a JR curve at room temperature for the same material, my JI is given at 670 kilojoule per meter squared using the standard procedure as given in the testing standard. If I measure the stretch zone, which is about 225, or the average, you know, it, it varies across the specimen where, uh, thickness. So you have, to, you have to take the average, and the average comes about 258 micron. If you offset that 258 micron of crack extension onto the JR curve, you get a J, what we call the JSZW, to be 594 kilojoule per meter squared. So that corresponds not too bad with the initiation toughness that you find. So this is, you know, when, when I say, when we say that the, the stretch zone can be used to measure the fracture toughness, this is what we mean. It gives you quite a, a good matching with the type of fracture toughness that you did, determine experimentally. So what happens to this when you're using, you're getting different expanses of stretch zone. So this is another for 285. Again, it matches not too bad. Uh, you get a JSZW of 565 and a J initiation toughness of 630 kilojoule per meter squared. So no, that's not too bad. But when you have these various expanses of stretch zone and you try to plot that onto the GR curve, you find that you can be totally out. In fact, uh, your maximum expanse of the uh, stretch zone, which is this 286, matches nearest to the experimental uh, initiation toughness Ji that you find. So you have to be careful with the stretch zone whenever you have a material which is going through a, a, a dynamic strain aging type of situation during testing. This is again at 235. So. Uh, to cut a long story short, that was uh, what we did, the type of work that we were doing for uh, the 20 MO, uh, MNMO NI55 steel. I think I have uh, another 10, 15 minutes, Prabhash. So I'll... Uh, oh, sir, uh, Bhadishya might be waiting. Okay, so, okay. so uh, can, I, can, I, can I take five minutes? Sure, yes. Okay. Sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, so uh, this is some work that we do. 
uh, did in uh, 304 Ellen Stainless Steel. Again, uh, a lot of people have worked on this, including some of them with Professor Badesia. But this is a work that was carried out by, carried out by Dr. Rima De, who was a research associate uh, with us. In fact, she's ending her tenure as a research associate with us very soon. So this was uh, part of her PhD work. And uh, the 304 Ellen stainless steel is used, as you see, this red arrow over here, as the primary heat transport piping material in a nuclear power plant. And if you look at the, the microstructure of an undamaged 304 Ellen stainless steel and a fatigue damaged 304 Ellen stainless steel, you find that a lot of features are revealed, which essentially tells you that a lot of damage has taken place in that microstructure. But how do you quantify that damage? So uh, we looked at, maybe I'll go through some of these slides very quickly because uh, this is nothing new. We looked at the low temperature, the room temperature and the high temperature behavior. So at minus 50, at 28 degrees centigrade and at 285 degrees centigrade. And looked at when we are doing low cycle fatigue, how the stress evolves. The stress amplitude evolves with the number of cycles and how does the life change? And uh, what we find uh, microstructurally is the bottom row are uh, optical micrographs, whereas the top row are SEM micrographs. We find that the features are different. Come to that later on. Uh, and how to quantify the difference? We found that the best way of quantifying that is perhaps by looking at the misorientation in the microstructure through EVSD studies. So for the low temperature tests and the high temperature tests, we find that there is a difference in the way that the kernel average misorientation, say, is distributed. It's much more prevalent for in a high temperature than at low temperature, where it's much more localized. And if you look at the grain orientation spread, which perhaps indicates the number of grains which are participating in the deformation, it's much higher in high temperature at 285 than at low temperature minus 50. And that is what is shown in this slide. If you look at the dislocation substructure, again, very similar, but in the low temperature, it appears that the cell formation is slightly reduced as compared to the situation at high temperature. And that is because a lot of martensite forms at the low temperature, which we all know. And this martensite, we also found out, uh, somehow has a preference for a certain uh, relationship between the habit planes of the austenite and the martensite, the nishiyama wasserman relationship, uh, which was uh, found out from the interfaces. And this is just an example. We have found out from a large number of uh, plots like this on the pole figure. However, when it comes to life, you do it at low temperature or the, do it at high temperature, there is not much difference. Uh, typically, if you use a life scatter factor of two, which is quite customary for fatigue life, all of the data fall within the same band, within that narrow uh, scattered band. The difference was perhaps in the character of the grain boundaries, which got altered due to the damage because of all the dislocation processes that were taking place. And we tried to, you know, from the uh, micrographs at the bottom where the grain boundaries are color coded differently depending upon, as we call them, LAGB, the, the low angle or medium angle or high angle, as we have defined it very arbitrarily, or are the twin boundaries. And we find that there is a, quite a lot of difference between the low temperature and the high temperature cases. But what, we, what I wanted really to present is what happens if there is multi-axial fatigue deformation of this material? So we want to do low cycle fatigue test of uh, 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 other multi-axial loading, multi-axial fatigue. So this is the type of specimens that we employ. These are hollow specimens with a wall thickness at the gauge of about 1.4 millimeter. And these specimens are gripped at the ends and uh, pulled in tension as well as torqued in torsion. And by you, you can you can create different types of multi-axiality by sequencing this uh, tensile pull and the torquing in phase and out of phase, so on and so forth. So what we were doing, just to just to put you in perspective, you can have multi-axial loading. So uh, the the uh, axial strain epsa or the shear strain gamma, they can be in phase 
if you are taking them through a triangular cyclic loading, as in the graph on the top, or the schematic on the top, so they can be in phase. So that in a strain space of epsa and gamma, it's like this red arrow like that, arrowed on both sides. So the straining direction is always fixed, or the shear strain and the axial uh, tensile strain can be out of phase, non-proportional as a result of which the strain path is cyclic. So the strain direction is changing continuously as, you, as the material deforms. And what effect does that have on the life of the uh, uh, material? So these are uh, the life plots, the Coffin-Manson plots of strain amplitude as a function of the number of cycles for different equivalent strain amplitudes. So equivalent con uh, computed as per the von Mises criteria for different types of loading as given by these uh, strain paths. So you have pure axial loading, uh, you have pure torsional loading, you have in-phase axial and torsional loading, and you have out-of-phase axial and torsional loading. And if you look at the, uh, uh, the live, you find that maybe with the in-phase loading and the pure axial or pure torsional loading, the life is not that much different. It's within the scatter band. But when you look at the strain path given by the OPT that is out of phase loading, the life is distinctly lower. So you're putting in much more damage when you're doing an out of phase load. And that is revealed very well when you look at the way the hardening or the stress is evolved during cyclic loading as a function of the number of cycles. So you have these four uh, uh, plots the first one on the left is for pure axial uh, triangular loading. The one on the bottom on the left is pure torsional loading. The one on the uh, right top is in phase loading and the one on the bottom uh, right is out of phase loading. And you can immediately see all these graphs have the same scaling in the axis. And you can immediately see that there's an immense amount of hardening whenever there is out of phase loading. And this hardening essentially reflects that you're putting in greater damage into the material and therefore you are uh, uh, lowering the life. So you can also compare, for example, more and more intense out of phase loading. So here we have taken triangular, sinusoidal and trapezoidal paths. So the strain paths are as follows. For the triangular, it's the blue diamond in the center. For the sinusoidal, it's the green circle the strain path and for the trapezoidal it's the red square in outside obviously the strain path is expanding although the equivalent strain remains the same and immediately you see that life decreases drastically when you go for the trapezoidal strain path which has the maximum area so we looked at how the damage is evolving at the microstructural level again looking at the local misorientation for again the four types of uh, multi-axial loading, in-phase, out-of-phase, triangular, out-of-phase, sinusoidal, out-of-phase, uh, trapezoidal. And immediately you can uh, visually understand the way the misorientation is changing. For the, and all this is for the same amount of equivalent strain of one person. This can be quantified in terms of the average CAM and the dislocation density through XRD, and those we have noted over there, and you see that there is a trend. Now, uh, if you look at the misorientation spread, the kernel average misorientation spread for each of these, again, they are quite similar, except the in-phase. As soon as you become out, out of phase, it changes, except for the fact that for the out of phase uh, trapezoidal, you are suddenly get a, getting a very sharp rise at a higher uh, kernel average misorientation. And that's actually because suddenly a lot of martensite is again forming, uh, whereas it is not forming to that extent in the other out of phase loading. Right. Uh, let me get along. We were looking at the grain boundary characters. Maybe I'll just gloss over them because it shows certain trends, uh, which is an extension of what I was talking about earlier except for the fact that for the trapezoidal loading, you suddenly get a very high amount of grain boundaries which are oriented between 10 to 50 degrees uh, misoriented to each other on either side. 
So uh, we looked at the, 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 the dislocation substructure development as you go from in phase to out of phase, the first column to the second column, you find that there's a reduction in the cell size. But when you go over to the trapezoidal, somehow the cells get a bit blurred. And you're not sure if you're looking at cells or something else. So is there some recrystallization? Is there some reorganization of the structure? Something is happening. Something's different. And we tried to uh, uh, quantify that through the number of cells per unit area, the fatigue life and the peak stress, and they make a story for the different strain paths. But what was interesting is that peak that we were finding was due to the Martin site. And we found that the rise in the medium angle grain boundary was because of that Martin site, because much of the Martin site uh, had orientations with respect to each other and with respect to the austenite, which had a, a misorientation of about uh, 10 to 50 degrees. So uh, that, in short, was what I wanted to say. This is just a concluding slide of this part showing that what are the, you know, just qualitatively what we saw for the various types of strain path of loading, for various types of multi-axial loading in phase and out of phase, what type of features we saw. And you can see a pattern if you look very closely of what is dominantly present and what is maybe just about present or faintly present and what is not seen. There is perhaps some amount of pattern in terms of you see Martin site, shear bands, micro twins, cells, twins, or stacking faults, etc. So uh, that's all I have, I think. So I'll end it over there today, essentially trying to establish the correlations between the structure and the properties and generating properties for structural integrity assessment. Thank you very much.